Good day, Sean, again. And we're just going to um, almost wrap up this uh, this first part of the subject and look at other moral theories and influences on healthcare ethics. It might not surprise you that we haven't actually covered all the moral theories, all the different uh, philosophical points of view that relate to bioethics and uh, healthcare ethics. But I thought I'd just cover a few more of the other uh, emerging and uh, common moral theories and influences on healthcare ethics, because the field is uh, is really still evolving. Now, the field of, uh, of bioethics is tending to a more uh, what we call a bottom-up approach rather than a top-down approach. Now, what this means um, is rather than apply abstract theories from a bunch of dead philosophers, which would be the top down, the idea is, is, to, is to develop pragmatic solutions in a collaborative or pluralist way. So that is using um, many sources um, and many influences and collaborating with as many people as possible. So problems and differences of, differences of opinions can be solved. And this is the bottom up approach. It's more of a, a, an organic uh, granular um, at the site approach. No, pardon me. One of the more recent approaches is something that sort of parallels the development of legal reasoning. And this is a concept called casuistry. Now, if you hear the word casuistry, um, you mainly hear it in the legal sense, but um, it's also a bioethical approach as well. And all it really means is case-based reasoning. So it's really similar to the legal principle of precedent. It's really similar to, um, you know, I guess in in this year, most of you will be studying uh, nursing, and you're going to go through a lot of case-based um, clinical problems. All right, so it's really similar to that. It's using um, what what has worked in similar cases before to use as a precedent to apply in a in a case now. So if there's an ethical dilemma in, uh, at in the clinical environment. We look at what we've done in the past that's worked uh, in terms of ethical reasoning. Now, it does, like anything um, that we talk about in ethics, it has its objections and people who don't like it. Um, and one of the objections is that it depends upon the clinician mainly um, in making these judgments. And the thinking is that it may lead to a, persi a persistence of paternalism, which has dogged healthcare over, you know, over the last couple of centuries. But many defenders consider that it, it works best if using like a common morality. It's a principles of common morality. And really, this is what principalism is, isn't it? So um, if you stick to those principalist um, ideas, not not like glue, not as rules, but if you use use those as, as a basis or a guide for good judgment, um, the thinking is that casuistry has many strengths. And you might see it used... Um, you know, if you work in a, an intensive care unit, for example, uh, with end of life issues, um, casuistry is, is a kind of process which I think is is used fairly commonly because we see many of the same types of um, ethical concerns popping up uh, regularly. So, an established way of dealing with something becomes like the norm. Uh, it doesn't mean it can't be crit critiqued or that it might be perfect um, and it cannot be changed. But, um, you know, if there's good reasons to do something, then why change it um, unless you have to, I suppose. All right. Now, we've already, now feminist ethics and, and uh, ethics of care is really big um, influence right now and has been for at least 20 years. It's been discussed already. So we'll look at um, rights theory or human rights theory. So you hear a lot um, and you would have heard a lot already in healthcare and in other disciplines about universal human rights. So it's not entirely new. Um, and Western nations have had bills of rights since the 17th century. Uh, Britain's had a, had a bill of rights since then uh, in in, uh, in its constitution. But a universal declaration of human rights was born out of the Holocaust in World War II. So this emerged in 1948. What are rights, though? Well, they attempt to articulate basic claims that persons can make upon other individuals and also upon society. There's two main types of rights. Um, they can be articulated as negative rights, which means freedom from something, such as freedom from oppression. So liberty is a type of negative right. It's the negative right to be free from oppression. And there's also positive rights, which require the provision of something to work. An example of a positive right is access to healthcare. So it requires someone giving you healthcare for that right to be enacted. So you can see from this that from rights become obligations and duties, and also from rights comes concepts of distributive justice. I've already talked a little bit about this distributive justice, and you'll see this in other subjects. Um, what that means is how to ensure that other persons in society have access to healthcare, for example. 
Now, rights are also articulated in healthcare and patients have rights. So um, we will look further on in the subject is at a thing called the Australian Charter of Healthcare Rights. So all patients have a charter of rights that we as clinicians adhere to. Now, in a similar way to principalism, rights are strongly protective for persons. They, they protect uh, citizens from the excesses of the state uh, and oppression from the state. And they're also designed to, to protect against things like paternalism and healthcare. But they spring quite strongly from the philosophy of, of libertarianism, which privileges the autonomy of individuals. And this has some negatives. Now, we've seen in the COVID response, strong libertarians have resisted mandation of vaccines and also lockdowns um, to the prevention of COVID. And it's really inter interesting to see the United States, which has a far longer and stronger history of libertarianism, has had fewer controls to manage COVID and correspondingly a massive mortal mortality rate from COVID. So libertarianism, um, when applied really strongly, certainly has its limits in efficacy um, for communities. So the opposite of libertarianism is communitarianism, which emphasises the community, it emphasises cooperation, and, the, and also privileges, privileges a thing called the common good, which is um, almost like utilitarianism. It's what is best for all people, for human flourishing as communities. And the hope um, and the feeling that if communities are strong and are flourishing, individuals within that community will be flourishing. So in communitarianism, individuals in society are expected not to emphasise their own liberty, but to work for the good of all, which ultimately will work for the good of all or in favour of all individuals. Communitarian arguments are also arguments of justice or what is fair. And you'll see them playing out right now in discussions over reproductive technologies, for example. All right. Um, another thing which um, I've seen emerging in my time in studying um, ethics is empiricism. I've talked about empiricism before. Empiricism is just a fancy word for using evidence over pure reasoning. So it's when you look at things like statistics, uh, you look at psychology, um, you look at evidence-based medicine, evidence-based nursing, evidence-based health, um, you look at other fields of study such as sociology, for example, and you use those in your in the process of um, applying ethics. Now, this is really controversial for philosophers because there's is a famous distinction that we make uh, that goes back a few hundred years, a famous distinction that we make between the way things are and the way things ought to be morally or ethically. And that distinction is called the is ought distinction. And you can't get ought from the is. Now, what, that, what I mean by that is um, just because we do something doesn't mean that we ought to do something, all right? The the ought or the moral um, commands or the moral reasoning should be should become purely from um, yeah, from the moral calculations, okay? So just because we do something, for example, slavery, and it seems to work for us, doesn't mean that it's something that we ought to do. All right, so empiricism is a little bit controversial because it's starting to bring in, well, <laughs> and I like empiricism you know, as a nurse. Um, I'm all for evidence-based practice. Um, and empiricism, what it does is it looks as, well, do actually the moral decisions that we make have a good effect? So there might be... Um, reasonable moral calculations but if no one's happy about them do the, are they really working and are they really moral so it's quite challenging to i suppose more abstract or um you know ivory tower philosophy department academic types of um, ethics and my ethics lecturers will hate me saying this because most of them are grounded very much in pragmatics but um it's, it's sort of the opposite to the, the applied or the practical approach of uh, of ethics. Anyway, so it's becoming a lot more dominant now, and it principally relates to descriptive ethics or you know, what people do and what people think. Um, so personally, I find this that I find this really interesting. It can't be used as a means of making moral judgments, but it's, it is always important to see how people, particularly our patients and families and ourselves, actually think and feel about health ethics that affect us and affect our patients. Now, and I'll give an example which might illustrate this a little bit. Um, now, despite the principle of respect for autonomy, and you're going to see this more and more over the next couple of years of your nursing degree, if you're studying nursing. Um, now, despite the principle of respect for autonomy, which is so fundamental, you know, it springs from this libertarianism, spring from this, um, you know, this really strong uh, focus in Western health and Western uh, ethics about autonomy of self. 
All right. Now, despite that, and despite the legal principle of informed consent that derives from that, empirical research, so actually studying patients, shows that many people don't want to make decisions for themselves. Many patients do not want to be informed, and many are perfectly happy and would prefer to have experts, you, know, you and I, and, and physicians and, and uh, doctors, make decisions for their best interests. All right. Moreover, clinicians themselves report that informed consent is actually more about a box ticking exercise than a valid communication between phys physician and to the patient. So um, this is really challenging, I think, not so much for, well, also for the legal principle of informed consent, but for the ethical principle of autonomy. You know, what if the patient doesn't want autonomy? It's really, really interesting. So I think that um, it's a way of always, you know, scrutinising what we do, uh, always applying, you know, evidence, an evidence basis even to moral theories that we use. So it's a really, I think it's a really powerful tool and you'll see this maybe used more and more as you um, practice as a clinician. All right. So ethics is really hard, isn't it? You know, there's a bunch of principles and theories out there, but how do we apply them all? It's, it's a little bit like evidence-based practice. There's often more than one way to achieve an outcome and often the decisions might even conflict with one another. So are we any closer to being prepared to make hard moral decisions at the bedside? Well, don't worry. The next lecture, I'll discuss a tool for moral reasoning and give you maybe some guides as to how this may be done pragmatically.